Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Hi. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure everybody's still awake out here. It's good to be with you on this rainy 4th of July weekend. This has been a um, soaker. I had someone set to water my pot, our pots on our, our back deck while we were gone this weekend, and I don't think they probably had to make a trip over at all because of the rain down in Cincinnati. They had to even cancel a Reds ball game on the 4th, so they probably didn't, um, haven't had to do any watering in my house. We even canceled a picnic we were supposed to have tomorrow in Cincinnati just uh, in case it would rain again, which I guess the forecast was supposed to, to do so. We uh, came up to, again, be with our family and our, one of our sons and his family came over from Indianapolis, and we had a nice family reunion on uh, the, the 4th and yesterday, and so it's been a very relaxing weekend. I hope yours has been an enjoyable one as well. Uh, I make just a few comments before I get into my into my message. I had read John Miller's email last night. I guess that was an email that went to everyone in the church, and Andy made a comment about the um, 150th anniversary over in Gettysburg. Um, I too am a student of history, and particularly American history. I've been to the Gettysburg Battlefield a couple of times over the years, and uh, there's one comment I would add to what he, he made. Uh, that battle was the largest battle on the North American continent, certainly the most significant during the Civil War. Uh, as I study, I've always studied history and American history, I've always wondered and tried to make connections in terms of biblical prophecy with the understandings that we have from the scriptures about America and the English-speaking peoples and the promises to Abraham. And certain connections, I think, can be made legitimately without stretching too much or reading too much into various things. But um, as I've studied the, the Battle of Gettysburg, I do realize not only was it the largest and most significant in that war, but it was also significant in, in that that battle in that war determined that America would remain together as a single nation. I think we all recognize the war between the states, as my mother taught it to me. She was a good lady from Alabama, and uh, <laughs> it was not a civil war. It was a war between the states, and the South still won in her eyes. But uh, um, anyway, that's another story. Um, that... That, that battle really determined that America would stay together as one nation rather than break into two. Um, Lee invaded the North, went into Pennsylvania during that time. Uh, he'd been on a roll militarily, and he was trying to strike a death blow and probably hoping that they could then reach an agreement uh, and end the war, and the Confederate States of America would then be a separate nation uh, as apart from the rest of the states. And had they won that battle, there's a good case that they could have, that could have happened, and America would have been truncated into two nations. Uh, and on the three-day battle at Gettysburg, on three different occasions, when you really study the details, the South could have won that battle. Uh, but because of poor generalship uh, and tactics uh, and decisions that were made, on all three occasions, they failed. And they failed the, uh, on the second day with, uh, because of the termination of a group of men from Maine that swept the Confederate troops off of uh, Little Round Top. And then on the last day, Pickett's charge was an effort to make one last piercing of the Federal line, and they failed. Had they done so, the way to Washington would have been wide open, as historians say, and they failed and they were repulsed. And though the war did not end for nearly two years, it was, for all intents and purposes, still over. It was over at that point. Uh, they, they never penetrated uh, any further into the north, and that was their high water mark, as they, as they call it. And when you understand the, the prophecy in Genesis 48 that Jacob made to the sons of Joseph, and when he put his hand upon the head of Manasseh and said that he would be a great nation, uh, that was a prophecy that has been fulfilled in the United States of America a single great power in this modern age and in the end time period in the modern world. There's no other uh, nation to look at to fulfill that specific promise made to, upon the head of Manasseh into America. And had that, not, had that been thwarted by America becoming two countries, 
uh, the South and, and the North, then we would have never reached the power that we did in the late 18th, 19th century on into the 20th century and become that power that uh, uh, liberated Europe on two occasions and stood, uh, has stood even to this day in the position that it, that it does. So there was a lot decided those three days in Gettysburg. Uh, not, uh, not only historically, but I think prophetically as well. And to me, that's what is the most uh, interesting history, uh, part of that history. Uh, uh, looking at the Gettysburg uh, 150th anniversary this year kind of inspired me to do a little personal study. I was going back into some of the uh, battles of the Bible and reading about one in particular, the Battle of uh, Michmash, told in First Samuel where Jonathan and his armor bearer climbed up uh, a, a rugged cliff and routed a Philistine army, just these two Israelites. And the interesting connection, what, what was taking place in Israel at that time under King Saul, that was a very pivotal battle in the history of ancient Israel. Uh, some of these things we uh, we can make connections, I think, when we when what may seem like just boring history from the Bible. But when you really dig into the details and understand the times and their, the implications for, in that case, Israel and Israel's place within the plan of God and all that the promises to Abraham meant, you, you see that individuals at certain times, whether it was in an ancient battle in Israel or perhaps even on a Civil War battlefield, individual decisions uh, made certain actions possible that uh, – kept the plan of God moving forward as he intended it, even in the midst of battles like that. So they're very, uh, to me, they're very fascinating matters to study. Um, I might be remiss since I've opened this subject up to, if I don't comment at least on one other item in the news, uh, I think we're all, if you were watching and understanding, trying to understand events in the world, you realize that this week uh, the military uh, authorities in Egypt pulled a coup and ousted the elected leader, Mohamed Morsi, uh, in Egypt, and that nation is going through turmoils. Uh, the, the millions, by estimates, millions of people in the streets, at least by one report, the largest mass demonstration in history uh, with people out in the streets demanding change uh, led to Mr. Morsi's ouster and has once again thrown Egypt into um, a turmoil and some certain problems in the midst of a number of other hot spots within the Middle East uh, that are taking place. There have been riots in Turkey uh, in recent weeks. The Syria civil war continues to unfold and now has taken a turn that is, seems to be keeping the President Assad in power, but it's drawn in uh, larger powers, not only in the Middle East, but also China, Russia, and the United States now. Uh, Iran continues its march toward a nuclear weapon. They've just gone through a, a change in their presidency. And with what's taking place in Egypt, it, it, it should catch our attention. Egypt is the largest Arab nation there in the Middle East. And they also have the largest standing army. And so whatever happens in Egypt is important geopolitically. It just is. And it, it bears watching, uh, certainly from a prophetic standpoint, because when we read in Daniel chapter 11 and the influx of the king of the south and the king of the north into that region, uh, there beginning in above uh, verse 40, Egypt is specifically mentioned, and it is mentioned as being overrun by the king of the north. Uh, it talks about the precious things of Egypt are there, so that Egypt and, and Libya are specifically mentioned. Of course, Libya's had its problems in the last couple of years with the Arab Spring and the uprisings throughout the, the Arab world. So a lot is taking place there. And I, I'm, not going, this is not a, I'm not going to give a sermon on prophecy today and get it too far into this subject, but I, I will say that because of uh, the Egypt's certainly prominent role there in, the, in that prophecy of Daniel, it is important to watch what is taking place, not that we necessarily have it all figured out. Uh, be honest, personally, I, I tend to keep a half step back from certain things and just keep my options open prophetically. I, I understand, the, uh, I think, and we always have had a basic trunk of the tree understanding of prophecy. Uh, it's when we try to get out on the branches and the twigs and the details that we get into trouble. And you don't want to get out on the branches and twigs, because that's where the bugs are. 
And you, get, you can get buggy. And you don't want to get buggy when it comes to prophecy, all right? So stay off the, the twigs. Just stay with the trunk of the tree. There's enough to understand there, but Christ did say to watch. And these events, especially in the Middle East, what's, what, you're, what you're seeing taking place in the Middle East, right, the last couple of years, is, is a potential redrawing of the whole map in many ways. Uh, the current map of the Middle East was drawn a little, little more than 100 years ago at the end of World War I when a group of the, the victors and some men you know, kind of hovered over a map in Paris and drew lines as to what would be the uh, outlines of the remnants of the Ottoman Empire that had broken up during the war. And essentially that map, I think uh, about 1921 or 22 when it was drawn, is still in place today. But it was drawn by men who did not understand the region, did not understand the ethnic and um, tribal entities in, in the region. And they just drew lines for political ends. And it has worked, and, but it's not completely worked. And a lot of the strife that we see, uh, the tribal strife especially, that is beginning to erupt in Syria and other places is as a result of lines being drawn that didn't really make sense and they separated peoples and created some artificial states. Syria is one, Jordan is another in that, in that region. And whether or not it will, com- it will come unraveled completely, that particular map will yet to be seen. But we do know prophetically that there are key events to take place in that Middle Eastern region, and that's why it's important to watch, that we will understand. And I, I don't think we have to... to dot every I and cross every T prophetically uh, to be fulfilling Christ's command. A lot of things will happen, and it's a matter of not being caught uh, with uh, unawares, and that's the most important thing. So um, be watching those things. Um, We continue to write about that in in our publications and broadcast about it, and uh, it, it is fascinating to watch and to understand. We are going to be doing a couple of or some Beyond Today programs this week. One of them will be on the four horsemen of the of Revelation. We have not done one in, on that subject, and that one's going to be done. And then we're also going to be doing a program on addiction to pornography. Steve Myers will be doing that program this week. And uh, at the home office, we're just wrapping up, we've just wrapped up the end of our fiscal year, and the income of the church has held very, very strong, and I want to pass along our thanks from the office and from the Council of Elders to all of you for your your support and uh, generosity. Uh, we've ended the year uh, above budget, and that's good, and it'll help us to replenish our, our reserves, and we are moving forward with, with our programs. We're right in the midst of camp season right now. Uh, plans for the Feast of Tabernacles are well underway, as you heard during the announcements. We are looking forward to a, a new class of Ambassador Bible Center students coming in in a, just a few weeks. And we have about 40, I understand, that are accepted, and that will be another large class that we, we have if all of those show up. So that will start about mid-August 19th, I think, is when ABC will start this year, and we're looking forward to having all of those students in. So uh, things are moving forward and uh, doing well from, from the office and uh, from the various aspects of, of the, the work of the church. So uh, we're kind of in that period of the summer, uh, middle of the summer, where we are um, anticipating the feast and uh, vacation period times and all of these matters. So... None of what I've just talked about is at all what I'm going to give as far as the sermon, um, Perhaps, except perhaps the Ambassador Bible Center reference could be a, a launching point for the sermon today. I, uh, I'm working off my iPad again. It seems like this is the only place, North Canton, where I give a sermon off of an iPad because I come up here not thinking that I'm going to speak, and then John Miller finds out I'm either in town or he decides to answer his email and say, go ahead and please give the sermon, uh, which he did two days ago. I sent the email two weeks ago and uh, told him at least I'd be here just to give him a heads up. And um, if, you know, I'd be willing to speak, I'm willing to sit and listen as well. Um, Doesn't uh, works both both ways for me. So uh, if the iPad holds up, I've got some notes. What What I would like to talk about here is a topic that I actually gave to the recently graduated class of Ambassador College Center students uh, as a kind of my version of a baccalaureate sermon for them uh, on a trip that we had made with a corral, the the choir there over to Indianapolis in early May. And I gave the sermon on that trip. And 
tailor it just for them, but it works for all of us. You know, Ambassador Bible Center students, uh, as we have it in our uh, fellowship here structure, they, they come in for a nine-month period to go through all of the books of the Bible and numerous other topics. Uh, we, we cram a lot of information into that nine-month instruction period. They go through all the, all the Bible, and uh, we go through all the doctrines of the church, and they get a lot of Bible intensely you know, done from about 8.30 every morning to 4.30 in the afternoon. And I don't know how they do it, but they do it. I couldn't set that long for nine months, uh, day in and day out. It just it would be too much for me. Um, you know, for two, two hours each week on, on the Sabbath service may be difficult and challenging for some of us as well. But they do it, and they willingly do it. And we give them a lot of information. They fill up their notebooks. They put notes into the margins of their Bible. They, are, they become acquainted with a great deal of information and resources from the Bible. And, you, you know, if they, if they diligently apply themselves, they can take in quite a bit. But as I was telling them, with our Ambassador Bible Center structure, it's not an accredited institution. We, we give certain tests just to help, uh, you know, encourage and to find out if we're teaching right, if they're getting the information. But it's not something that's necessarily going to show up on their transcript. Uh, we give tests, but they don't get they don't either pass or fail necessarily. We're fairly lenient in certain things, and that's the way it works. But what I told the students is that for that period of nine months, they get a lot of classroom lectures, and they get they take a lot of notes, and they are given certain tests. But what Ambassador Bible Center can do, and whatever testing we may do, will only help us understand and help them to grasp what they put into their head for that period of time, what they've retained. When they leave Ambassador Bible Center, they have to go back to their normal lives. Many go back to college. Uh, others go on to, uh, into the work, uh, the work world, and go, they go about their life. And when they get out into life, just as you and I get out into life, that's when they will really be tested on what they have learned, but in a different way way. They will be tested in the laboratory of life. And when those tests come along, they'll find out, and God will find out, what they know in their heart. In the classroom, you can give a test, and you can find out what a person knows in their head. But it's when you get into the the laboratory of life that you really find out what one knows in their heart, when those kinds of tests come, the real tests of life. And that is altogether different. And I think Jesus gives us an example in the Gospels of how he did this with his own disciples and set us up to teach us something along the same line. If you turn over to Matthew chapter 14, we'll look at an episode that we're we're all well familiar with today. And it's actually, it's a dual episode beginning in verse 13 of John 14. We're going to pick up, however, the story in verse 22, but I want to just skim over quickly, beginning in verse 13, where Jesus was and what he did. Beginning in verse 13, Jesus was, in a sense, in a classroom setting, where he found himself one day with about 5,000 people in front of him, and he was teaching them all day, probably near the ancient city of Bethsaida on the north Um, northeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And as the day came to a close, the disciples came to Jesus, and they they said to him, you know, send them away, verse 15. They they might go into the village and buy for themselves food, as if the Kentucky Fried Chicken would be open late that night. Okay? Well, Jesus said, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. In verse 16, they said, well, we only have five loaves and two fish. That's all they had, 5,000 people. He said, bring them here to me. And he commanded, in verse 19, the multitudes to sit out on the grass. Now, this is after a day of Christ teaching, which he had done from a boat. Uh, and he'd, he'd been healing, and it had been a, a, a long day. He had them set down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven. He blessed them, broke, and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave it to the multitudes. 
They ate, they were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Quite a large potluck. And if you look carefully at the, at the wording, it seems that the disciples were bussing tables that day. They set up the food lines. They were acting as deacons. They, were, they weren't yet apostles. They hadn't really been sent out. They were still disciples, still in learning and training. And they were part of this, this instruction, this classroom period too. But they did the work that day. And believe me, ladies, as you know, when you do a pitch-in, potluck, for one of our between-meal, between-services affairs that we always have in the Church of God, you know how much work it is. A lot of work goes on to get us, to get us men fed with fried chicken. By the time we get to those chicken legs, you ladies have done a lot of work. So you know better than we do how much this was. So it was a long day. This was the classroom section of it. But the teaching wasn't over. Remember, Christ was spending an intense period, three and a half years, with his disciples to get them ready to go out and to do greater works with the church. This was their time of training. And it was a three and a half year period. And just as what we do today, you know, when you go to college, you go to classroom lectures, and then with some classes, you have your labs. And you will spend a lot of time, in many cases, more time each week in a laboratory for biology, chemistry, physics, whatever it might be, than you will in a classroom lecture. And that's where you really get some hands on experience in the lab, right? You cut up the frog. I loved it, loved that part cutting up the worms and the frogs in biology class. Or you get to, you know, pour things, you know, do the experiments and keep notes. And, and it, it's some hands-on training different from theoretical. This is how Christ was approaching his work with his disciples. He trained them. He taught them a, quite a bit. But he also gave them practical lab experience. And here, beginning in verse 22, we're going to see what he did. If you pick up the story in verse 22, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. Now we're going to go ahead and I'm just going to read through verse 33, set the stage for this, this story and the lessons that we might learn for, from it. Because this is their time to go out into a laboratory experiment, okay, the end of this long day. So let's look at it here. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat, and to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Now, the other side means, in this case, when you read this phrase in the gospel accounts dealing with the, the Sea of Galilee, what it means is not that they went the entire width of the lake, which was a large lake, uh, but what they did was they went to the other side, being the other side of the Jordan. The Jordan River flows into the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And it is at that point when you cross over from one side to the other, east to west or west to east, biblically, from a geographical uh, perspective, you're crossing over to the other side. So it was not the whole width of the lake. It was just basically a cross where the, the inlet of the, sea of, of the Jordan River into the sea. And it was a short distance. He, uh, they got into the boat to go before him to the other side, and they were moving basically from an east to a west direction on that northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. The multitudes were sent away. When he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And that area has plenty of mountains uh, that come right down to the uh, near the lake at least, and there were plenty of places that he could have scrambled up and uh, got away from the, uh, anyone just to have some time to himself. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. 
And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him, and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is a well-known episode and story from the Gospel accounts. And in it is a great deal of teaching for us. As I said at the beginning, this was the second part of the methods by which Jesus would teach. He, would, he gave a sermon on the mount, three chapters in, in, in uh, Matthew. He gave other t- times of instruction, one just completed here. But then, as we all know, you've got to take your, your lessons learned, the material that you put into your head, and you have to go out and live it. This is where the disciples had an opportunity to live and to apply what they had learned. Education is of no value, I was once taught, unless we learn how to apply it successfully in life and how true it is. And this is where we see the disciples coming upon a great distress on a great body of water and Another miracle performed, watching Jesus walk on water. Peter walks on water. But they are also at grave peril with their life in this episode. Let's consider a few points as we come come back to the story. First of all, this story takes place on a great body of water. In, In Israel today, this modern state of Israel is still there. You can go and... Uh, if you ever have an opportunity to take a trip to Israel, you can go up to the Sea of Galilee. You can get on a boat, rent a time on a boat that will take you out onto the water. And the, that boat is roughly about the same size, perhaps, as the boat that they were in. Maybe it's a little bigger. It's motorized today. They were not on a motorized boat. But they, they've built these boats for the tourism trade there. and They're, and they're, they're like fishing boats, and they're quite nice, uh, Open, big open deck. We were on one for a recent uh, for a trip that we were on a number of years ago with a church group after the feast, and uh, we went out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and they, the captain cut the, the motors, and uh, we we had some um, hymnals with us. I think we'd mimeographed a few hymns, and we had a sing along out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee with some of the hymns from our our church hymnal. It was very memorable, very enjoyable. It happened to be a calm day. It wasn't anything like this this night here, and. There were a lot, any, a lot of other traffic going by, and we just had a few moments of calm, and we sang some hymns out on the Sea of Galilee and went on our way. Uh, it is still fished to this day, and it, uh, it, it recent years has actually been, uh, the water level has been going down, at least uh, it had been the last time I read some articles about that. I don't know if that's come back up in recent uh, the recent years. But uh, there's a lot of activity around the, the shore, and you can see you can go to these various various scenes from the the Gospels and the, the New Testament accounts. Have you ever stopped to think about how many great Bible stories take place centered around a boat? There's, there's this one right here. Think back. Of course, there's Noah. He had a pretty big boat, didn't he? Uh, Jonah got on a boat, running from uh, the work that God wanted him to do. Uh, The Apostle Paul made a journey from Caesarea to Rome in the book of Acts on a boat. Probably one of the big barges that would have plied between Egypt and Rome in those days carrying grain to to Rome. Uh, Several scenes in the Gospels occur on the Sea of Galilee, like this one here. Uh, Another well-known one is the at the end of the book of John, where the resurrected Christ has a big fish fry cooking for the apostles, the disciples, when they come in off of a fishing trip there after his resurrection. As you look through the Bible as well, you will also see that great waters, lakes and seas, are a theme on which God teaches big, big, very big spiritual lessons for us. Genesis 1 and verse 1. At the beginning of the Bible says the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. 
So the story of the Bible even begins over a great expanse of water. In Revelation 22, the last chapter in the Bible, it ends with a river of life flowing out from the throne of God. There in Revelation 22. One of my favorite psalms or or verses in, in, in the psalms is Psalm 107, verse 22, where it reads, Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. There's something about a body of water that can just take you in and you can, it can mesmerize you, it can amaze you, it can calm you, it can get you kind of terrified at the same time. Uh, water has a way of doing that. Of course, Israel passed through the Red Sea, and the, Paul, the Apostle Paul used that to, t- to show us that that was a type of baptism in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This episode in Matthew 14 is set, of course, on the Sea of Galilee. Another point to consider about this story is that it is set in the night. In fact, it is in the middle of the night when this event happens. In this case, a great wind comes up. Now, winds on the Sea of Galilee coming up to this degree, creating dangerous conditions, uh, are not uncommon even today. Uh, there, are re- there have been reports just in, even in recent years of uh, waves created by wind upon the Sea of Galilee upwards of 12 feet high. Now, that's, a, that's a big wave. But what happens, if you understand the geography of the region, the Sea of Galilee is kind of in a, in a depression. It's not below sea level like the Dead Sea, but it's, it's nestled in between mountains. And to its, to the, on the western side, there's some rather steep mountains that come in off the plain of Jezreel and the Mediterranean Sea further to the west. And what happens is winds will come off the Mediterranean, whipping down the Vale of Jezreel, and because of the passes that are in this region just above the Sea of Galilee, they kind of get funneled into some of these passes and come down with a great deal of force, and they burst out on the Sea of Galilee and create waves like we read about here. And it will happen very, very suddenly still to this day. So it's not an uncommon occurrence. And the conditions are right there for that to happen. The Sea of Galilee is really just a a huge lake. Sometimes I think about Lake Tahoe in Northern California uh, as a comparable body of water in the United States to kind of understand what this is, but it is called the the Sea of Galilee. But uh, those waves still happen to this day. Now, Matthew's account here tells us that it happened in the fourth watch, which is in the middle of the night. It's in the middle of the night that often things bad happen, don't they? You know, they say nothing good happens after midnight. You want to be at home after midnight before before then? Uh, pretty good rule of thumb to live by. You know, you, you've heard of the, uh, the the phone call in the, in the middle of the night. Uh, when I was in, uh, in the pastoral ministry, anytime my phone rang after midnight, it was never a good call. Something bad was always on the other end. And it was usually meaning I I was going to be heading to the hospital several times through the years. I'd get a phone call after midnight, and I'd be pulling my clothes on and uh, head off to the hospital because that's that's sometimes when those things happen. Um, You've heard the phrase, things that go bump in the night. Well, uh, that's when things happen. And in this case, that's when this storm came up. Now, there were 12 men in this boat. Here's another point to consider. Twelve disciples. Several of them were experienced fishermen. It was not a large boat. If you, they've even uncovered, uh, archaeologically, they have uncovered a, a boat, a fishing boat from the first century. And they have it on display over there on the Sea of Galilee. And, uh, the last trip I made over there, we, we saw this. And it's, uh, for twelve men to have been on that boat, it would have been a bit chummy. Okay. But there would have been enough room for them to spread out and, and go to sleep. Um, but that's where, that's where they were. And, of course, they were a bit nervous, and even the experienced fishermen were, were uh, nervous because they were in a tight spot and they couldn't get out. What it seems to have happened in this story is that they all fell asleep, 
and the boat drifted out into the middle of the water when the waves came up. And suddenly they were caught unawares, uh, but caught in a dangerous situation. How many of you have ever been in a boat on a body of water and suddenly the waves start coming up and you get a little bit frightened? I've been, I've been in that situation. And even with a life vest on, you begin to get a little nervous. I've hap- had that happen with a small canoe, and I've been in a bigger uh, boat uh, on choppy waters a- as well. I've never been on anything like the perfect storm type of waters. I hope I never am. But, you know, when you, especially if you're in a small boat like a canoe or a kayak, and you get caught and, and you know, weather comes up quick, and you, that water gets choppy, and you realize you could capsize. And it's a long way to shore. You start getting scared, even if you can swim. And like I said, even if you've got a life uh, vest on, because you're in deep water, as we say. And you suddenly realize, whoa, things could happen. So you try to keep that boat upright. You try to paddle uh, you know, back to shore and get out of danger. These were experienced men on, on this water, and they were still scared. And the, the waves came up. And all of a sudden they woke up, found out they were in the middle of a lake. Now Christ sent them out on the water, if you remember. And it's not like he sent them out intentionally into danger. For whatever reason, their neglect caused them to drift into harm's way. My theory on this story is that they were, they were just dog tired. As I said, they'd been serving a potluck to 5,000 people and the cleanup and everything and they were tired. And they got in this boat, and they just fell asleep, and the boat drifted. That's my theory on why something like this would happen with experienced fishermen like Peter or John on board. But it happened. And you, it leads to another question, would, would Christ have intentionally set them up for this? I don't think so. He did send them off, and he went up to the mountain to pray. But... You know, in a situation like this, you have to remember. And when you're looking at this as a, metaphorically, to teach us lessons about life and trials and the suddenness of danger and a testing of our faith and how we react in a dangerous situation, and when we might be tempted, rather than blame God, we always need to look back on ourselves. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 tells us, that no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That's a comforting and encouraging verse, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. We are tempted. Now James goes on in, in the book of James, chapter 1, and He talks about how we're drawn away by our own sin and we're enticed and that gets us into trouble and and, uh, temptation. it's, It's our situation, it's our life and our decisions that create the temptations and the tests that happen in our life. As in, in this case, we can't blame God. We can't blame Jesus. He sent them out and it was not necessarily his deliberate intent, but it did come up we can't we can't blame god when we may be tempted as james says we need to always recognize our choice and, and our responsibility but when we come back to the story it teaches us a great lesson because no matter what we do and the problems we might get ourselves into and how high the waves might be in life and how dark it might seem at times in a time of difficulty in a passage in our life When we're making a transition, as often happens, sometimes the trials happen when we go through what they call life transitions. With age, uh, divorce can be a situation like that, the death of a mate, uh, a critical illness. And we're we're going through a life transition and and a a loss of a job. Whatever it might be, And it's testing us, and it may be testing us over a period of time, of several weeks, perhaps several months, maybe even several years. And we're tempted to blame God. We're tempted to give up 
in, uh, on our faith and abandon what we know, abandon ship, so to speak, throw everything overboard, go back to what we were or what we think is safe and comfortable, and things can get pretty dark. And we go through all types of challenges when we're in those, those situations. And yet, as we look at this story here, we see what what Christ was teaching them. Because in their neglect that got them into harm's way, Christ saw it and he came to their rescue. He went toward them. From his perch on the high mountain, he saw what was taking place. And he went toward them. Because as, as the account shows us, they saw him walk. Now, they didn't recognize him at, at first. They thought it was a ghost. But he went walking toward them. Now, think about it for a moment. He was on a mountain praying. The winds came up, and he saw that, that they were in trouble. And he went out toward them. Did he have to do that? He was God in the flesh. He could have calmed the the seas just like that. Stopped the wind. But he didn't. He says he walked toward them. Now that's interesting. Was that another one of his kind of his little tricks that he had up his bag that he wanted to wow them with? Wasn't enough to feed 5,000 people with a a handful of fish. Was he thinking, wait till he see this? I don't think so. He could have swam toward them. Let's just think about it that way. He didn't have to walk on water. I happen. Let's, let's imagine that he was an Olympic swimmer and he could have swam through ten foot waves. After all, he was God in the flesh. But he didn't do that either. He walked toward them. Why would he walk toward them? Again, my opinion. I think he walked toward them so that they could see him. Had he stayed on the mountain and just calmed the waters and went back to praying, they might have gone back to sleep, but they wouldn't have seen him. Had he even swam through the waves, they wouldn't have seen him. But when he walked on water, they saw him. And that's important. They had to see Jesus. Just like you and I need to see Jesus. And we need to see God, the Father. We need to see him in our life. We don't need to see him doing a trick to amuse us, and to strengthen our faith necessarily. We need to see him every single day and from the total picture that we get of him in the Bible and to see the reality of God, the reality of a relationship with Christ day in and day out, to know that he is there and that he can be accessed, that he is our high priest, that he is working for us, and that we have through a relationship built day in and day out, year after year, when we get into a tight spot, we still see him. That's what is important. I think that's why he walked on water. So that they could see him in the dark of night, in the midst of a troubling situation, wherein they could have drowned. And those are the times we need to see God too. And have our eyes awakened out of a sleep and out of a stupor and clearly able to see Jesus Christ. To look upon him, fix our gaze upon him. You know, they looked on him and initially they thought he was a ghost. They didn't recognize him. And they had been with him all this time at this point. It was not like he was a stranger. They could obviously see, see the figure. There's a lesson even in that. Those even closest to Christ don't always recognize him at times. To recognize and have a relationship with the true Jesus Christ is a very important matter. That's why Christ went to, to length, great length to warn his disciples in Matthew 24 against false Christs. Those who come in my name, he said, that, and they will deceive even the elect if possible. The deception of anyone, of of some speaking in his name, claiming to represent him, 
very cleverly masquerading with all the nobility and benevolent qualities of, of God can be very, very tempting. Here his disciples didn't see him. It can be a challenge for us to recognize even the true Christ today at times if we are not constantly developing that relationship and aware of the power of deception. In John 17 and verse 3, in his last prayer, Jesus essentially said that the, the essence of eternal life was to know the one whom the Father sent. To know you and the one whom you have sent. He said, this is eternal life. This. This is eternal life. John 17, 3. To know you, the one true God, and the one whom you have sent. The one whom the Father has sent. That's eternal life. That's, that's the heart and core, the essence of eternal life. As we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, as we teach the truths of God, as we teach the truth of Scripture, and as we live it, that part of our mission and our commitment helps us to keep our eyes firmly fixed upon Christ and understanding not only who He is and what He is, but what He's doing. And to see Him, especially in the midst of a personal time of challenge and difficulty, to where we can recognize that He's there in the middle of a night at a time of great challenge in our own lives. Why didn't they recognize in that moment when they awakened, why didn't they recognize the one whom they had just seen do a miracle? Well, perhaps one of the reasons is fear. They were scared. Fear causes fog to develop in our heart and in our minds. Fear can cause us to lose clarity. Clarity of purpose and meaning. It can cause us to lose our vision. If you're afraid you're going to lose your job, if you're, going, if you're afraid you're going to grow old, if you're afraid you're going to lose your job, if you're afraid of something that you have to do and don't want to do it. Sometimes then we just we get so immobilized by that fear. We can't make the right decisions to move forward, to move out of the way, to move through the time of challenge. Fear can freeze us in place. We can't move. And if we can't move, we can't grow. If we're not growing, we're going to lose ground. Fear is the great enemy of faith. It really is. And to the degree we learn to conquer our fears, manage our fears, handle the fear, overcome our fear. I don't know if I'll, I don't know if I'll ever outgrow fear. Some people can do fearless things. Some people, you know, it depends on what the situation might be. I remember the fears that I had as a kid. A lot of them I grew out of. I still have fears as an adult. We all do. Uh, how and how will we handle those? That's the challenge. That's this life of faith. Fear kept 11 of these disciples from doing anything. Fear kept them in the boat. They couldn't move. And that was a, that was a major problem. Christ, when he was walking toward them, he issued a summons. He said, come to me. He was walking. Now, another one of the gospel accounts, and in the, in the, the way the language is in the, in the original, it gives the indication that actually Jesus wasn't actually walking directly in a beeline toward the boat, but he was walking on the water. And Peter saw him walking on the water. And it's almost as if he was walking kind of in a direction away from them, but close enough to where they could see him. And that by getting out of the boat, Peter was following him. Okay? 
And so he said, come to me. And Peter had to go in the same direction that, that he was going to. And, when, and Peter was the only one that did. Peter crawled over the boat, and as you, we read in the account, he actually started to walk. And he, he made it however many steps he took until he realized what he was doing. And then he was overcome again by fear. You know, it's like, whoa, I'm not supposed to be doing this. What am I doing? I'm walking on water. He realized what he was doing. He had time to think about it. And all the, you know, the fear came back in and the doubt and the uncertainty. And you can't do this. You're going against nature. You're, you're, you're not, this is not happening to you. And that's when he began to sink. When we look at this story too often, we focus upon the fact that Peter started looking around and he started to sink. And we forget the very fact that he actually took some steps on water. How many steps have you made on water? I can tell you how many I've made. Zero. I can't even ski on water. Every time I tried to kick those skis off and go barefoot, it never did happen for me. I can ski with a big board, you know, under my foot. But I could, I could never do barefoot skiing the times that I would try it. I, I long since gave that up, trying to do that. But I've never walked on water. And I, nobody's hand went up, so I guess none of you have either. So we're all in the same boat. We're with the other 11 disciples. You see, Peter at least got out of the boat. And I've, I've heard, I haven't read the book, but I heard, heard, I've heard there's a title of a book that to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. And it's a true statement. If you're going to do something extraordinary, if you're going to do something faithful, if you're going to go toward God, you've got to get out of the boat. If you're going to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. We have to get to the point where we can leave our comfort zone. Whatever our comfort zone might be. This whole way of life called the truth, following God, the church, what, all that we are a part of, living by the truths of God is a life of faith where we had to get out of our boat of life that we had at one point and we ventured out of our comfort zone. Experiencing a relationship with Jesus Christ requires each of us to leave what is comfortable and to go to God, to go toward Christ. We have to get out of the boat. That's what Peter did. The others didn't. Give him credit for that. And he did take a number of steps before he did begin to sink. And Christ pulled him out. Didn't let him go down all the way. Doesn't say how far he went down. Maybe he went down to here. Maybe he went down to here. Maybe he went down to here before he pulled him out. I, I don't know. You know. God will let us at times sink pretty deep. Just to the point where we might think we're going to go under before he pulls us out. Peter was a, obviously, as we know, a unique person. You know, he's the one, he said to the Lord here in verse 28, he said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. If it's you. Peter was always the one of the twelve that was speaking out, saying his mind, um, speaking up in a crowd. He was the one who would betray Christ. As I've thought about Peter and studied him over the years, I've come far beyond the conclusion that Peter was the chief, all that meant that he was a chief apostle. That's not what it meant at all. He, he was a leader, certainly. And he, he became a, a, a leader within the ranks of the apostles. And certainly his story is one that's focused on before Paul's in the book of Acts. But to say that he was the chief apostle and this and that is, uh, reads into the scriptures more than, than is there. What I think about Peter and the reason that he was always in the front of the group, always the one speaking, raising his hand and, and leading the charge and whatever it might be, and, and in this case, is that I think Peter wanted the affection, attention, and the, the approval of Christ perhaps more than any other disciple. He had such high regard and respect for Jesus that he, he wanted his approval. 
You ever had someone that you, you, you wanted them to like you? You know, when you were a kid, maybe it was a popular person in school or the, the, the prettiest girl or the, the cheerleader or the smartest one in the class or just the, the neatest, coolest kid in the group. And you wanted their approval. And you'd be willing to do almost anything to get their attention, to get their approval. I think that's what Peter wanted with Jesus. He, for whatever else was working in his life, he wanted this man's attention. And he wanted his approval. And that's why he had the answers. That's why he said, I'm not going to betray you. I'll go with you all the way to the end. And Jesus said, no, no, you won't. You'll betray betray me three times before the rooster crows. I think that's why he did it. And I think that's why he got up over the boat side and started walking and took the steps that he did. You have to think big to take that first step, to go anywhere or to do anything of significance. And that's what Peter did. He got out of his comfort zone, and so do we. We have to get out of ours. And as long as we keep our eyes on Christ, we can stay up. We can actually walk on spiritual waters above the waves and problems of this life or through them or manage or maneuver with them as they will come at us. And the high waves and the danger, uh, enough that they could scare us to death, don't because our eyes are on Christ and Christ was able to be clearly seen of these men in the dark of the night and above the high waves of the sea he didn't hide himself and he doesn't today he made himself very clear to these men and he can he makes us he makes himself very clear to us today even in our little boat called the church of God and brethren it's a little boat it's not a big ship. I don't care whatever whatever name you want to put in front of Church of God or after Church of God or in between Church of whatever. It's a little boat. Very little boat. And yet Christ has made himself very, very clear to us. And he's done so at a very critical period in our, our short history in the United Church of God and for our own life's sake. That our hearts would not be hardened. Mark's account of this, uh, of this in Mark 6 and verse 52 says that their heart was hardened as if they were of one heart. There was something else that was working there among the, the disciples that kept them from, at that moment, learning everything that they, they could. We, we must make sure that our heart is never hardened. When we look at this story... And we take it back to the context of the feeding of the 5,000. And we contrast the two episodes. One, a land-based, day-long teaching that Jesus undertook. And another, a middle-of-the-night, harrowing experience, more like a laboratory. Where what they had heard and what they had been taught had to be applied in faith. We get a real-life lesson there. For all of us to understand. Don't fear life. And don't fear any human being. Don't fear any experience. God's taught us that. We've heard that. We've read that. Let's make sure that we have the faith to apply it when it fear comes. When our faith is challenged. Don't fear the waves. Don't fear the dark. Don't fear that which comes upon us in in an unexpected manner. Don't fear any man, but fear God. Fear God. He's the one who can destroy both body and soul, as Christ said on another occasion. Don't fear anything else, but certainly fear God. Be willing to extend yourself beyond your comfort zone and push yourself spiritually and above all, Keep your eyes on Christ. He's the one who will get us to the vision. 